even though we threw this out in first opposition, that's why I was really very eager to talk to people uh, about the video. So let's be so let's measure how we created this in our policy. We told that in our policy that cases of abuse was entirely a breach of contract and therefore illegal. And therefore this fell, fell under a government's jurisdiction to maintain law and order in these things. So this was with, so this was out of the scope of this debate. Because it didn't consider cases like abuse because it was entirely naturally illegal. This was out of this debate. So second, second idea, and this is where they missed out by the uh, second idea, this is where they missed out the Gabriel's subject. Because Gabriel told you about majoritarianism, where it is students' immature minds. They believe, they really accept societal perception blindly. They accept what their parents tell them blindly, without logically thinking. When this allowed for things like majoritarianism, for students to dictate who which teacher gets promoted to senior positions, to, uh, to educate. What they, uh, what they said in, do, in those interviews based on which religion or which race this person, this teacher, was not responded to on their side of the house. We told them how they perpetrated majoritarianism and racism on their side, they didn't respond. So let's ask two questions. Number one, are students a good marker to make decisions or promotions? And number two, who achieves better outcomes of all parties? So number one, are students a good marker to make decisions or promotions? And this is where proposition two says students are a good marker to make decisions because they spend lots of time. We ask them why. We give them three reasons why students want a good marker and why any information gained from them was necessarily very flawed. We told them number one, students are immature. That scientifically they have a less developed prefrontal cortex and that apparently they lost the debate on two graphs. Number one, that the vast majority of primary school students and early secondary schools can't be rely on to tie their shoelaces properly, much less dictate the life of an individual and the entire career. Second, we told them that things like the right of choice, they ignore that even if the government acknowledges that even when students are viscerally impacted, such as going for learning jobs, they don't have the maturity to decide. What did they do? They told us in second figure, when we take responsibility of them, they somehow alchemically transform from young and immature students to, they, to become mature individuals who can decide how they are to make proper decisions on the lives of their teachers. This didn't work, they didn't provide any analysis for why they work, for, for why they work. We told them how students work inherently towards their self interest that they wanted things like less work because it then resulted in a more relaxed and enjoyable life. That students don't like harsh but necessary things like scolding students for bad attire or for submitting late work all the time. Their side changes the decision making calculus of when they turn it into a popularity contest. When it's not about letting how about teachers letting their students face off law every lesson. But for example, doing things like cracking down less harshly on this condition or releasing them for break because they've already done their work. These are the subtle things, the nuances that we put on their side harm the impact or harm students and harm teachers. And of course, for all these reasons, because we better benefit both the education system and students as well. Go inside the Before I begin my reply today, I have two key clarifications for this house. Number one, since our first speech, we have told you over and over again that students' opinions are just one factor. All they have thrown at us from all your best speeches was that you can't let a 70-year-old decide a man's livelihood. And we don't think that this is existent in the debate at all because this is not our policy. I encourage the opposition to further study what we have brought to you today and because of this, we've taken the debate. But secondly, before I begin, they have lost this debate because they have effectively failed to clash with everything we have brought you. All the, all the alternatives that brought us, albeit crazy, can be subsumed by our side. We can put VPs in every single class. We can install CCTVs all over the school too. So we don't think that anything that brought us is mutually exclusive and for these reasons we have taken the debate. So, three main clashes emerge from the debate today. Number one, legitimacy of students in making decisions. Number two, attitudes of teachers in class and outside of it. And number three, messages sent by both policies. So I'll now show you how the proposition has taken all three of these and effectively the debate is formed. So first and foremost, right, I'll the legitimacy of students. We told you throughout our case that students have an incentive to get the best teachers to help them. So well, I think it's great that all two enjoys playing football, but what they, all they did in response was homogenize students. Yes, maybe sometimes a rebellious streak emerges, but in the long run, a majority of students are responsible enough to know what's best for them. They told us that students are dumb, and I think this is an extreme mischaracterization. So to take them on the test case scenario, this is a flawed perception, and even if they are, we say that there will be science interviews, students will exhibit science
signs that they're not happy with their teachers. And what we said that this is enough to obtain what they're trying to get across. So now also, we told you about the effectiveness of one-to-one -one interviews. And we told you how one-to-one -one meetings are likely to draw the truth from students. So this is when they gave us all their strange ideas about having vice principals sitting in lessons every day. We have told you already, vice principals have jobs, they have duties. And what we think that our policy is far more viable, because not only does it empower students, it also cooks them out of their shelves. So because of this, we have taken this quite a whole. So now on to my second clash, which is on the attitude of teachers. Now they came up and told us that students have to spend numerous, no, we told you, that after, that after students spend numerous hours of their life with their teachers, they will be able to understand deeply their personality and psyche. So they never really gave us a clear response to this. All they told us was that their methods of CCTVs and sit ins would show them the true nature of a teacher. We have already disproved this and this reasons this point is they addressed. But now finally, on to, mess on to messages and culture. We would like to say that they've told us throughout their case that abuse is illegal. But ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter if it's illegal and it doesn't matter if they breach their contract if they're not caught. We say that it's harder to catch them in their policy because students aren't taken seriously. More often than not, it's your word against mine. Students are not given any real legitimacy and because of this, we protect students better. Now, we think that students should become more proactive and responsible for what they say. And because of this, we have taken the point as a well. whole. So, if we stop a culture that alienates students, destroys classroom environments, and comes up with views, I am extremely proud for these reasons to stand for our proposition.